Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to this week's uh, Physics Colloquium. Uh, today we have a uh, guest all the way from Yale University, where they just got some snow two weeks in a row. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. D Divine Kuma, I just want to tell you a bit about his background. He got his PhD uh, from the University of Michigan in uh, applied physics where he studied with uh, Roy Clark and he studied uh, uh, imaging internal structures of semiconductor uh, quantum dots and uh, also complex oxide interfaces uh, for his, uh, some of his thesis work um, and more recently he's moved to Yale University uh, where he's uh, working as a, a postdoc in the, the lab of Charles Ahn uh, and he's working on uh, <clears throat> molecular beam epitaxy growth of uh, oxide materials and uh, silicon and gallium arsenide, as well as uh, uh, X-ray uh, structure <coughs> determination and uh, uh, X-ray uh, spectroscopy of materials, and probably a few other things. But those are some of the some of the highlights. So today he's going to tell us about some of his recent work uh, at Yale. Uh, 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 and the title is Atomic Scale Control of the Structural and Transport Properties of Nicolate Thin Films. Okay, I'll put it in, in, in out. No. And uh, here's the gift that we uh, traditionally give our uh, colloquium speakers. All right, thank you very much. Can you open it? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Bad at opening gifts. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, once again, thank you very much for coming and for the invitation to talk to you about some of the exciting research I'm doing, trying to use synchrotrons to study the atomic structures of very thin outside films and how I, we can use the, the information we get from you know, understanding the structures of these very thin films to control their transport properties. <coughs> so, by way of introduction, the world around us is full of many examples of um, materials which have the same group of atoms or the same atom um, forming its basic unit, but these materials will have very vastly different microscopic properties simply because of how the atoms are arranged at the atomic level. So a very good example is a case of carbon, which can manifest itself as shiny, expensive diamonds when the carbon atoms are arranged in this particular crystal structure, or as dark, formerly use, useless, but currently very useful graphite from which you can get graphene, when these same carbon atoms arrange themselves in these hexagonal um, lattices um, bounded by these weak forces. So my role as a materials physicist is to design new materials by understanding how these atomic scale arrangements affect the microscopic properties. And this involves using tools which enable us to characterize materials with picometer scale resolution. So I'm going to be telling you about how we can use synchrotrons to achieve this high resolution characterization of you know, a new class of materials. And in designing materials, we also have to be able to grow materials with atomic scale control. So I'm also going to be telling you about how we can use a method known as molecular beam epitaxy to design materials one atom at a time based on the information we get from these characterization techniques. And in designing new materials, it's very important to um, have a component from first principles theory. So I work a lot with um, theorists to combine our understanding of how the structural features we identify using X-ray diffraction relates to you know, the functional properties like magnetism and transport, and how we can combine these three things to design new materials. So the example I'm going to show you today about how all these three work together is to show you how we can tune the transport properties of a class of materials known as the rare earth nicolates. So there are many material systems a lot of people work on, but the one I'm particularly interested in is a class of materials known as complex oxide materials. So these materials are complex because they contain two or more metals in the crystal structure. And they are oxides, of course, because they contain oxygen. 
And these materials generally have this basic crystal structure where one of the metals, usually a trans uh, transition metal ion, occupies the center of a cube surrounded by an octahedra of oxygen atoms. And the other metal ions occupy the cube edges in the crystal structure. So I refer to these materials as designer materials because you can pretty much get any physical property you want in condensed matter physics by simply changing the different metals, the chemistry of this material, or by inducing very small distortions in the way these oxygen um, atoms sit related to the rest of the structure. So some examples of these complex oxide materials with a wide range of properties include materials like barium titanate. So it's a complex oxide where you have barium at the corners and titanium in the middle. And this material is insulating and ferroelectric. Whereas you can also change the chemistry to get materials which are magnetic and superconducting, um, all by changing chemistry and structure. So complex oxides are exciting because since they all have very similar crystal structures, you can envision stacking layers of the different materials with different properties um, to make new devices or to get new physics. So one, way, one thing you can envision doing is taking a material, complex oxide for example, which has magnetism, and putting it in a layer structure next to a material which is superconducting or ferroelectric, and then use the magnetic field to you know, change the magnetism in this field and indirectly change, for example, the properties of the adjacent layers. And so it's kind of like stacking Lego pieces, and these pieces have very similar structures. So you can form very complex hydrostructures, combining materials with very different unique properties. So a lot of these materials have been studied a lot in their bulk form, and in the bulk form I mean when they are very thick, or a single crystal form. And when you make a material into a thin film, you should expect that the material will behave very differently from its bulk property. And the reason you should expect this is because for example, this material here is a thin film grown on another material. The, this thin film has a small thickness in the vertical direction, usually a few atom layers. But it has a surface and an interface where the atoms have a very different bonding, um, bonding and chemical environment from the bulk material. And as I'll show you in my talk today, these surfaces and interfaces in very thin films have very important implications on the physical properties of these materials. And it is very important that we're able to determine very precisely how the atomic arrangements and the atomic positions change, both at the surfaces and interfaces of these very thin um, oxide films. So just generally, there have been two examples in the past few years of thin films grown on oxide substrates, which have produced physical properties which have received a lot of uh, attention. Um, one case is the case of iron selenide, which has been grown on strontium titanate. And iron selenide in this bulk form is a superconducting material below 10 Kelvin. But when you grow it on a bulk insulating strontium titanate su substrate, people have discovered, I'm sorry, this is 2014, very recently, in the past two and three years, that you can get a, this interface here forming a superconductor with a TC very close to 100 Kelvin. And so it's important that we understand how the bonding at this interface occurs to try to explain why we have this enhancement in TC, which will help us to design new materials with, hopefully, TC is very close to room temperature. Another important material where you have um, interfaces producing new effects is a case of lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate. So in this case, lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate are both complex oxides, and in their bulk form, they are both insulators. But people found that when you grow very thin films of lanthanum aluminate on strontium titanate substrates, the interface between these two materials forms um, a, mater a, a two-dimensional electron gas, which is very highly conducting, and at very low temperatures has superconducting properties and magnetic properties, which do not occur in the bulk forms of these component materials. So how do we create very thin layers of these materials? Um, the way we do this is to use a technique known as molecular beam epitaxy. And this method of synthesizing these thin films takes place in the high, um, ultra high vacuum chamber, where we heat up the different metals we would like to deposit to form an oxide material in the presence of oxygen. And as we heat them up, they form beams of the different metals, and they react with oxygen and condense on the substrate, forming an, at an atomic layer of the film we would like to create. So in this particular case, we are heating up barium and titanium and oxygen, so we can form a layer of barium titanate on the surface of the crystalline substrate which we choose 
um, based on what kinds of uh, strain or what kind of effects we would like to induce into these films. Um, during the growth, we can monitor the film crystallinity and the film thickness using a technique known as reflective high energy electron diffraction. Mm -hmm. So this involves an electron being incident on the sample and reflected onto it and screen. And uh, by monitoring the intensity, if we get good diffraction, which means we have a crystalline film, we can monitor the film thickness as a function of time. So we can very precisely grow films with thicknesses ranging from one unit cells to as thick of number of layers as we want using read control. We can also change the materials we are depositing simply by changing the elements in our uh, perfusion cells um, for, for the growth of these films. So this is what one of the systems we have at Yield looks like. The UHV system is actually at the very end of, of the, this whole complex looking beast. Um, but it's attached to an export system and uh, a transport system which enables us to characterize some, do some characterization work on the samples without bringing them out into vacuum. But a lot of the films we are growing are stable in air. So this is actually overkill. But um, anyway. So we can grow these materials very well, but we would like to actually see where the atoms are going and how they are rearranging uh, when, when we do grow them. And the way, I, I, the, the way I, we can do this is to use X-rays, because X-rays have wavelengths very close to the spacings of the atoms and the materials we are interested in, which is on the order of the, on the Agatron scale. And X-rays also have a large penetrating power, so it, it enables, enables us to not only look at the structures of the surfaces of these films, but enables us to probe the subsurface layers in a non-destructive way, which is very important uh, because we like to characterize these materials without perturbing the atom atoms in, 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 in the systems we are probing. So X-rays can be used in a variety of ways to investigate you know, structures. Most of you are familiar with going to the doctor or to the dentist and getting an X-ray of your hand or your teeth. And so in this mode, you're looking at the X-ray intensity which is transmitted through an object. And the contrast you get here depends on the density and the elements in the material, but you don't have enough contrast to resolve the positions of the atoms in the hand, for example, in this figure. So to get true atomic scale resolution imaging using X-rays, one has to use a mode called diffraction, in which you are scattering from the crystalline plates in the material you are probing. And so by measuring the diffraction at angles using a detector, um, you can determine from Bragg's law, what the spacings of the atoms in your material are by using this equation here, which relates the wavelength of the incidence photons with the angles at which you observe constructive um, interference in the diffracted X-rays. And this enables you to determine what the spacings D of the atoms in your material are. So, in, for a bulk material, for example, we can represent the bulk material as a material having these layers spaced by some lattice constant A. Once you measure in a diffraction experiment, uh, the Fourier components of the structure of the material. So it's like going from time to frequency domain. Uh, so in this case, in a typical X-ray measurement, we should only expect to see peaks at very specific angles or very specific points of reciprocal space, uh, given which are related inversely to the spacings of the atoms in our material. Uh, so by measuring these peaks, which are the Bragg peaks, we can determine, we can go back and determine what, how the atoms are spaced in our system. The materials we are interested in are very thin films grown on bulk crystalline substrates, where you have a thin film with a different structure from the substrate and an interface in the surface. And as a result of this new structure, we have what we call a truncated lattice. So the material is no longer periodic in the growth direction. And as a result of this truncation in the in the periodicity, the vertical direction, we end up having X-ray diffraction intensities occurring between the Bragg peaks, so these intensities you see here, which contain all the information about the structure of the film interface and surface. So we have to measure these very diffuse intensities very precisely and analyze them in some sensible, reasonable way to go back and determine what the structures of our films and surfaces and interfaces are. So this is what a typical um, measurement looks like along what are known as crystal truncation rods for a thin film grown on a substrate. So here I'm plotting the intensity we measure as a function of angle, and the angle is represented by this value QZ, which is a reciprocal space vector defined in terms of the substrate uh, on which we, the film lies. 
So as you can see, at integer values of QZ, we have these very sharp peaks, which are the bright peaks coming from the substrate. And in between these peaks are these very weak intensities, which are close to 8 to 10 orders of magnitude lower than the intensities of these bright peaks, which contain all the information related to the thin film whose structure we would like to determine the surface and the interface. And so it's very important that we measure these very intensities very precisely to be able to get good enough data to analyze to get the structures of our films and interfaces. So to get good intensities, we have to use X-ray sources which produce enormous amount of X-rays. And the two sources I've been involved in working with at Yale are the Argonne National Lab, the Advanced Photon Source outside of Chicago, and the NSLS at the Brookhaven National Lab in Long Island. And so this machine produces X-rays by accelerating electrons very close to the speed of light. And as these fast-moving electrons are deflected in magnetic fields, they produce X-rays which have very high intensities, in some cases about a million times brighter than the intensity coming from the sun. And so this what um, so the X-rays produced by the synchrotron comes into our experimental room, which is called a hatch, uh, along this direction. And our samples are mounted on this robot-looking system called a diffractometer, which rotates the detector and the sample to sample different regions in reciprocal space. And then we control all of this outside of the hatch here, so that because you don't want to be inside here when these X-rays are coming and hurt yourself. So what? In the kinds of experiments I'm interested in, I'm interested in sampling reciprocal space in three dimensions. And so, what I'm showing here are examples of these crystal truncation rods along different directions of reciprocal space. And what we do is we collect many, many of these rods to sample 3D, three dimensions in reciprocal space. And we analyze each of these data points here using a coherent bright analysis um, to determine the phases associated with each of these points. And once we're able to determine the phases using this COBRA technique, we can combine them with the intensities we measure, simply take an inverse Fourier transform to get a three-dimensional electron density map, which gives us the layer-by-layer -layer structure of our film, surface, and interface. So this here shows an example of real data we've obtained for a platinum nuclear thin film grown on lanthanum aluminate, where the blue regions correspond to empty space, and each of the bright dots here you see correspond to an actual atom. So we can tell what type of atoms are in our structure in a particular lattice site in X, Y, and Z uh, because these intensity, intensities are proportional to the atomic numbers. So the very, for example, oxygen has a low Z, so oxygen is like these light balls here. And we can differentiate between titaniums and aluminums, and so aluminums, lanthanums, and nickels uh, simply by their scattering factors, which are proportional to the atomic numbers. So we've Applied this COBRA technique for a very wide range of systems. Uh, we've been able to look at systems where we have multiple layers. For example, in this case, we look at barium titanium, lanthanum titanium, lanthanum aluminate on STO. Where using this technique, we can very precisely profile the composition gradient, um, which tells us, that, which shows us that there is significant intermixing at these interfaces uh, when we go these heterostructures. We've also been working on growing complex oxides on silicon and germanium because it's important for making transistor devices. And one important point people would like to know is how these complex oxides form on top of these semiconductors. So we've applied this a technique to look at the material as strontium titanate grown on silicon. And also look at how semiconductor quantum dots form and how they interact chemically with the substrates in which they are grown. So today, I'm not going to be talking about those things. I'm going to be talking about more recent work I'm doing, looking at a material called lanthanum nicolate, trying to understand how metal oscillator transitions occur in the system and their dependence on how the films are terminated. So the red nicolates are perovskites. They have the same structure I showed you at the beginning of the talk, where the red earth ion occupies the corner of the cube in the, in the crystal structure. In the middle of, the cube, of this structure, in the green balls here, you have the nickel ions, which are surrounded by the oxygen, in the, shown as the red balls. And unlike the perfect perovskite structure, the octahedra in the, in the red nucleates are rotated um, with, with respect to each other. So as a result of these rotations, you can see that there is a distortion in the nickel-oxygen-nickel bond angle, which ideally should be 180 degrees. And in the bulk from these materials, people have shown that you can control these rotations by simply changing the rare ion in the system. So all these rare ions have the same formal charge of 3 plus. 
So when you change, go from lactinum, for example, to lutetium, all you actually, all you actually do is changing the size of the red eye ion in this, which fills the void in between here. So when this red eye ion is very big, like lanthanum, the octahedrite cannot rotate too much. And as you replace it by small and smaller red eye ions, this octahedrite can rotate, do rotate more and more to fill up the volume of space you, you need in between these octahedra. And the consequence is that as you go from lanthanum to lutetium, you distort this nickel oxygen nickel bond angle more and more. So this distortion is important because charge conduction in this material takes place by um, charge going from nickel to oxygen to the next nickel. And when this bond is ideal and close to 180 degrees, it's easy for the charge to move. And as you distort it more and more, it's harder for charge to hop and the materials become more and more insulated. And so this here shows the phase diagram of the resistance versus temperature for different wear ion materials. So lanthanum nucleate has the least distortions. So the bond angle here is close to 180 degrees. And the orbitals responsible for conduction are the nickel 3D orbitals and oxygen P orbitals. So when this bond angle is close to 180 degrees, these orbitals overlap very significantly and it's easy for charge to occur, transfer to occur. And lanthanum has a low resistivity at room temperature. And this resistivity goes down as you decrease temperature which tells you that this material is, in its bulk form, a metal. For all the other red ions, the resistivity increases as you go along the, the periodic table. And they also have a finite temperature where they go from being metallic to being insulated. And this transition temperature is also correlated with the degree of distortion of this nickel oxygen bond angle. Because as you distort this bond angle more and more, the overlap between the orbitals gets less and less, and it's harder for charge to pop and conduction to take place. So, what, as I told you, when you grow materials and make them into thin films, you should expect that maybe some of their properties might change. So I've been interested in looking at lanthanum nucleate thin films to study how their properties change when you make them into thin films. And um, so we've been growing these films on lanthanum aluminate substrates. Lanthanum aluminate is a bulk insulating substrate and it has a lattice constant which is very close to that of lanthanum nucleate. We're able to grow these films with very high quality. Um, but before I go into the results, I'd like to point out that you can envision lanthanum nucleate films as having alternate stacks of lanthanum oxide and nickel dioxide. And if you consider what the, the formal charges of lanthanum oxygen, nickel, and oxygen are, um, you can also envision this material as having alternate layers of positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative charges. And since we can grow this material with atomic scale control, we can either terminate these films with nickel dioxide, which has a net negative charge, or lanthanum dioxide, which has a net positive charge. For the films which are terminated with, nic with nickel dioxide with a net negative charge, uh, as you can see, we're going from a negative charge at the surface to vacuum with zero charge. And this polar discontinuity, this charge discontinuity leads to a surface field which points out of the plane of the film. <coughs> When we go to films and add a lanthanum oxide layer, because we have a positive charge here, we should expect that the surface field should point downwards. So what I'm interested in studying is how changing the surface termination and this surface field will affect the transport properties of these very thin films. So here I'm going to show you how the transport properties, that is the resistivity at room temperature evolves as a function of thickness, and as a function of surface termination. And on the on this part of the plot, I'm showing you how the resistivity changes with temperature. So for a very thin film of lanthanum nucleate with three full unit cells of lanthanum nucleate, if we terminate it with nickel dioxide, we see that it has a very high resistivity at room temperature. And this resistivity goes up as you lower the temperature, which means that these films have either insulating or semiconducting ground states. Very surprisingly, when we add a single atomic layer of lanthanum oxide, we see that the resistivity goes down by an order of magnitude, so the materials become more metallic and become highly conductive. And this resistivity goes down with temperature, which is evident of the fact that the films have now become metallic. But even more surprisingly, when we add another layer of nickel dioxide, we find out that the resistivity of the film goes up again. And it goes back down again when we add a lanthanum oxide. So there's this oscillation in the resistivity, which depends very strongly on whether we are terminating our films with a net negative charge or a net positive charge. 
And so from our understanding of the bulk reactor clade, where this nickel oxygen bond angle is important, what I'm interested in studying is whether the films are changing their structures when we grow them and change the surface terminations. So we've performed this cobra analysis of films with different terminations. And so here I'm going to show you vertical cast through the electron density maps, which show us the lanthanum oxide planes and the nickel in between them and the nickel dioxide planes. So what we found, which was very surprising, was that in, so in the bulk material, even though you have these rotations, on average, the nickels and oxygens occupy have an average same Z position, and so should the lanthanums and the oxygens. But what we find is that the, lamp, the, oxy, the nickels are moving up related to the oxygens, and also related to the lanthanums in, 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 throughout the film. And this distortion is very large at the surface, so it's about a third of an angstrom displacement between the oxygen sublattes and the nickels. And it decays exponentially as you go down towards the interface with the lanthanum aluminate substrate. And, so, and this distortion also occurs in lanthanum oxide planes and also decays relatively exponentially as you go down towards the interface. But very surprisingly for our film terminated with lanthanum oxide, so in this particular film, the topmost layer here is lanthanum oxide, we find that the distortions are very large in the lanthanum oxide layers and even larger than in the case of the, the topmost nickel oxide layer for the insulating film. But very surprisingly, the nickel oxide planes remain relatively undistorted. So in, in this case, this nickel oxide planes are highly distorted, but in this particular case, the nickel oxide planes have no distortions, just like the bulk materials. So one, and uh, so I should point out that the, uh, well, I'll talk about it here. So the question then was, what, why are these two films behaving very differently, just simply based on how we are terminating them? And so one should consider the fact that you have not only the electrostatic boundary condition due to the fact that you're changing the surface charge, but you also have very different mechanical boundary conditions for the films terminated with nickel dioxide and the films terminated with lanthanum dioxide. So for the films terminated with nickel dioxide, you have the electric field which is exerting a force moving this nickel ion up, but there's nothing on top here to constrain the motion of the nickels. So you have this round plane of the oxygen nickel planes in these films. On the other hand, for the lanthanum oxide terminated films, the surface field wants to put, push the nickel, positively charged nickels down. Um, but up here, you have an oxygen atom ion which is being moved upwards by the electric field because it has a negative charge. And the fact that you have a, a very strong bond between the oxygen and this nickel gives you a mechanical force here which counteracts and happens to cancel out the downward force of the, the, on the nickels. And the net effect is that you have nickels and ox oxygens here which are co planar and nickels and oxygens in this particular case which are backward. So why is this buckling important? So I told you about rotations. But one way you can also distort or decrease the overlap between the oxygens and the nickels is to move one of the ions up or down. And so in this case, moving the oxygens up and down or the nickel and the nickels up effectively reduces the overlap of the orbitals between oxygen and nickel. And this explains why these films that enter with nickel dioxide tend to have high resistivities and insulating light transport properties. Whereas in this particular case, because the oxygen nickel planes are more or less not buckled, we have very good overlap between the orbitals and very good uh, metallic properties of these lanthanum oxide films. So one way we can also quantify or directly measure the overlap between the oxygen orbitals and the nickel orbitals is using an X-ray technique known as X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So in this particular technique, we also use synchrotrons and we use the fact that we can tune the energy of the synchrotron, of the synchrotron X ray, incoming mean, photon X rays, to excite um, transitions from the core oxygen one state into the unoccupied states. And so, this is what a typical spectrum looks like for the oxygen, at the oxygen K edge. Um, there are lots of wiggles in this plot, but what we are interested in is this very small peak below 530 electron volts, which is a direct measure of the overlap between the nickel d orbitals and the oxygen p orbitals. So when this overlap is large, you should expect a very large intensity of this peak. And when the overlap is small because of distortions, you should expect a reduction in this pre-peak intensity. And sure enough, when we do this experiment, we find out that there is an oscillation in the, the pre-peak intensity where the nickel oxide terminated surfaces, because of the polar distortions we observe structurally, have very low pre-peak intensities. 
Whereas the films terminated with one carbon oxide, which are metallic, have relatively high intensities of the pre -peak. So this same exact pattern we observe here is directly correlated with the oscillation in the pre -peak intensity in these films. So we went on to study nickel dioxide films in more detail, and this was motivated by the fact that many groups around the world have been growing lanthanum nickelate films terminated with nickel dioxide. And what they found was a very interesting property of the system, that independent of whether you were straining the systems tensile or um, that there was always this thickness dependent metal oscillator transition. And what do I mean by that? Um, so let's go. So what they found was that, and what we found was that very thin films of lanthanum nickelate, so I talked to you about films which were less than four unit cells thick. These films had very high resistivities at room temperature, with resistivities which went up. And when we went five unit cells, the films became very metallic. And by the time you went to 50, 50 unit cells, the films became bulk like and had resistivities very comparable to what the bulk values were. Uh, so I should point out that here I'm normalizing the resistivity to, to the thickness so we can compare films with different thicknesses uh, very well. So what is interesting is that you have this transition here from films which are metallic with this downward slope to films which have this little like transport behavior for films that are with nickel dioxide. And so we decided to study to see if there were any differences in the properties of these lanthanum nickelate films for the very metallic films, 7 unit cells thick, and the more insulating films. And what we found was that for the very thin films, all the surfaces, irrespective of whether you had 3 unit cells, 10 unit cells, 15 unit cells, that all the surfaces had these strong polar distortions, which I, talked, I showed you before. And so here I'm plotting the distortions as a function of the distance from the surface. Y0 is the surface of the films. And as you go down, you go towards the substrate. And so all the films for four, five, and seven unit cell films had very large distortions in the nickel oxide bonds at the surfaces with a decay length of about four to three to four unit cells. So by the time you go to the fourth or fifth unit cell, the bond angles were very close to what the bulk like value should be. And so we were very surprised by this result. We didn't very really sure whether it was just due to extrinsic or intrinsic effects. So we talked to our theorist collaborators who um, decided to calculate what the relaxed structures of these films should be. And what they found was exactly what we found experimentally. So these are the theoretical results of what the distortions are for films with similar thicknesses. And they found that exactly as we see that all the films have these very large polar distortions on the surfaces with a decay length on the order of about three to four unit cells thick. So the take-home message is that irrespective of the film thickness, if you grew a four unit cell thick film or three unit cell thick film, the entire film will be strongly distorted. But as you add more and more layers to your film, you end up having layers below the surface which have bulk-like bonds, which explains why the materials become metallic below this critical thickness of about five unit cells. So again, for an eight unit cell, thick film, so it's seven unit cell thick film. The top here is highly distorted, but the layers below here have bond angles similar to bulk, which explains why they are metallic. Whereas for the films which are four unit cells thick, because the thickness of the film is comparable to the decay length of these structural surface distortions, you have a reduction in the hopping ability of charge tra hopping to occur, and this is latent like transport properties. <coughs> So the question then is, if it's due to just a surface property, a surface relaxation, then what happens if you take the surface away? And a simple way to take a surface away is to cap it with another material. And this, in this particular case, case, we chose to cap it with lanthanum aluminate uh, because lanthanum aluminate is insulating, so we don't expect it to contribute to the transport properties. And lanthanum aluminate also has the same plus minus stacking sequence. So we effectively move the surface field away from the interface here with the lanthanum nucleus film to the surface of the lanthanum aluminate capping layer. So we grew these films, we took them to synchrotron, characterized the structures, and sure enough, we found out that for the films which are capped with lanthanum aluminate capping layers, there were no distortions in the nickel oxide planes or the lanthanum oxide planes in between them. And the bond angles we measured were very close to where the bulk like values were. So if this was really true that these distortions were changing conductivity, then you expect that the resistivity should also change 
because you are removing these separate distortions. And sure enough, so for a four unit optic film, we see this increase in the resistivity. But when we cap a three unit optic film, which is smaller in thickness than this four unit optic film, we find out that the resistivity decreases as we decrease temperature, uh, which shows us that we've been able to effectively, by understanding why these surface distortions occur and how they affect transport, remove them and effectively make very thin films of lanthanum nickelate metallic. So, I'll move to the last part of my talk, which is trying to engineer cuprate like orbitals of lanthanum nickelate. So, a lot of the interest in lanthanum nickelate in the past few years has been due to a recent proposal uh, by these two theorists, Chaluka and Kaluwe, who proposed that if you're able to engineer certain properties of cuprates which have high TCs for superconductivity in a material like a nickelate, you can effectively make a new material which is superconducting with a very high TC. And the properties which they proposed, which you had to emulate, were that you had to have a material which has a net spin one half, which the nickelates do possess. You have to have a material with strong anti-magnetic anti correlations, which some of the rare nucleates are known to possess. And you should also have a material which has quasi two-dimensional two -dimension, two conductivity. And as I showed you, we've been able to make very thin films of lanthanum nucleate conducting, so we've been able to effectively achieve 2D conductivity in these nucleate thin films. The last and important feature one has to be able to emulate in the cuprate, in the, uh, emulate this, uh, a property known as orbital degeneracy. And so in the cuprates, copper has nine electrons in its outermost D shell. And these ele nine electrons are split between the T2G and the EG energy levels. And due to the crystal structure of the high TC cuprates, there is a, what we call a crystal field splitting, where the, one of the orbit EG orbitals has a lower energy and is completely full. And it's the orbital called the DC square orbital, which lies in plane. And the outer plane orbital it has a single electron um, with a higher energy. So above the Fermi level, this material is what we call a single band system because it has only one band above it, which is half occupied. Whereas in the nickelates, you have seven electrons in the D shell with six of the electrons filling the lower energy T2G shell and one electron which is shared between the, the two EG orbitals. That's the Z square and the um, X square minus Y square orbitals. So the nickelates, as we have right now, uh, degenerate and they are multiband because we have these two um, energy levels at the Fermi level. And the goal is to be able to make the nickelates look like the cuprates. Oops. Uh, let me just connect this. is to make the nucleus look like the cuprate by breaking the energy, the degeneracy of these two orbitals and by doping with electrons so that we have an electronic structure which looks just like the nucleus. And the hope is that once we can make a material like this, then we can think of ways of um, further doping to hopefully achieve superconductivity. Um, I should point out now that we don't have a superconductor yet but I'm going to show you that we've been able to successfully break the orbital degeneracy to achieve this electronic structure, um, which mimics what the cuprates have. So, after we had discovered this polar distortions on the surface of these um, nuclear films, our theory, theorist collaborators decided to, de to calculate or to determine what the electronic structures of the surface layers of our nickel dioxide films were. And what they found was very exciting and interesting uh, in that they found that for the very top layers of our lanthanum nucleate film where we had these strong polar distortions, there was actually a very large energy splitting between the z square orbitals and the x square minus y square orbitals by about more than an EV, which, was, which is actually very big uh, because in bulk, this is like zero. So being able to move these bands of type by EV uh, is very significant. And the reason this large energy splitting occurs is that we have no oxygen at the top of these nickels. Um, so the bonding environment, as, as I told you, at the surface of this film is very different from bulk. And because of these polar distortions which occur in this material, you also have an elongation in the epical oxygen, this oxygen bond, oxygen nickel bond, related to the in-plane bonds. 
So this differences in the bonding input and output plane result in the different, different energy levels of these two bands. So one can appreciate it. No one wants to make a superconductor out of a surface. So we came up with a new superlattice structure where we combine lanthanum nucleate in a repeating superlattice heterostructure with lanthanum titanate and lanthanum aluminate where the properties of these systems were to use lanthanum LTO and lanthanum aluminate, which are both insulators for confinement. And the reason we chose lanthanum titanate was that titanium has a lower electron affinity than nickel. So according to the calculations, and what I'll show you that actually exists in this film is that the titanium atom donates an electron to the nickel. As I told you, we would like to dope the nickelate. So this electron transfer is actually beneficial for moving towards the cuprate um, electronic structure. The other important feature of this material is that because of this electron transfer, you end up building an internal field very similar to the surface field I showed you. And this field points upwards from the LTO to the LNO and from the LAO to the nickelate layer. And the effect of this internal polar field is that you're going to move those oxygens far apart from nickel, just like we have at the surface of our atom nickelate thin films. And sure enough, for this three component heterostructure. What the theorists find is that you have a slightly even larger splitting in the energies of the input and outer plane orbitals. And what we like also to do is to have the Fermi level um, lie uh, completely above the z-square orbital. So in theory, in theory, what the structure should give us is a material which is single band and non degenerate at the Fermi level, just like the cuprate, cuprate materials have. So the first thing is, we, so we actually grew these materials and we've characterized them to determine what the structures of the films are and to determine if this electron transfer actually occurs. And the way we do this is that we use the same X-ray absorption spectroscopy um, technique I showed you before. And in this case, we are probing to excite transitions in the titanium, at the titanium L edge, where we should expect that if indeed the lanthanum titanate is donating an electron to the nucleate, it should go from having a 3 plus ox oxidation state to a 4 plus oxidation state. So what we do is we measure the spectrum for our tricolor um, heterostructure and we compare it with two materials where titanium has a 4 plus oxidation state in STO and a 3 plus oxidation state in bulk lanthanum titanate. And we see that the spectrum here looks very much like the STO where titanium has a 4 plus oxidation state. So just as theory predicted, the titanium is indeed given an electron to something. And we determine that the electron is going to nickel by performing the same extra absorption spectroscopy at the nickel K edge, where we can look at shifts in the, in the K edge absorption. And what we find is that there's a shift for our tricolor super, um, super lattice, which corresponds to the fact that the nickel is actually going from nickel 3 plus to nickel 2 plus because it's taking an electron from titanium. The next part of the, of the project was to actually confirm that the oxygens above and below the nickels were being moved apart. So the theory shows that the oxygen here moves up and the oxygen here moves down. And we perform the same cobra analysis of the of a single repeat of the structure. And what we do in these part is that the oxygens you know, below the nickels are moving down and these ones are moving up a little bit. Very similar to what the theory, expert, um, theory predicts. So the final thing we can do is to probe whether the in-plane and out-of-plane orbitals have different occupations. And the way we do this is using an extra absorption spectroscopy with the uh, linearly polarized X-rays. So when we have the X-ray polarized in the outer plane direction, we can preferentially excite transitions into the orbitals with the Z-square um, character. And when we switch the polarization of the incident X-rays to light in plane, we have transitions into the in-plane X-square minus Y-square orbitals. And if the material is non-degenerate, we should expect that these two intensity should be similar. And if we are indeed splitting the energy levels significantly, we should expect that the occupations of these two and these two absorption spectra should be significantly different. So we started off by looking at a lanthanum nuclear lanthanum aluminate bilayer, where we don't have the internal electric field and the distortions of the apical oxygen. And what we see here is that for the both the, for the outer plane and the inner configurations, the intensities are shifted slightly in energy, but they are very similar in intensities. For our tri-component superlattice, we observe that the outer plane and in-plane orbitals have very different intensities, which tells us that we are moving the energy bands significantly apart in the chain of occupations. 
And this is a very strong direct um, indication that the, theory, the theoretical prediction of being able to split the bonds in this material is actually true, and we've been able to achieve this in this tri-component superlattice. So just to summarize that part, we've been able to show that using X-ray diffraction, you know, so we went from just looking at the surfaces of these films, and the theory gave us an input into what direction to go in tr into trying to split the orbitals. And we've been able to confirm these theoretical predictions of an internal polar field by looking at the positions of the oxygens and nickels using this cobra technique. We've been able to also verify that the electron transfer does occur from titanium to nickel by using X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And using this X-ray absorption linear diagnosis technique, we've also been able to determine that we're actually breaking the orbital degeneracy in this material, making it look more and more like an actual cooperate material. So what we're currently interested in doing now is to dope these materials, uh, because this is what it, the cooperate phase diagram looks like. In the ground state of most of these materials, it's either anti-ferromagnetic insulators, and you actually have to add extra charge to make them superconducting. So we are currently working very hard to do our uh, tricolor component superlattices to hopefully make them superconducting. But it's more challenging than it sounds. So, so by breaking the orbital degeneracy, does yes. generally speaking increase the anti-ferromagnetism? Or but maybe you don't have any data on that? I wouldn't have any data on that. Alright, so looking ahead, there are many directions we can go in trying to understand uh, all these other complex oxides. Uh, so for example, there's a lot of complex oxide materials in which below critical thicknesses, they undergo transitions from having bulk-like properties to having non-bulk-like properties. Um, and a good example is the lanthanum strontium manganite system, which is a magnetic metallic material, which below a critical thickness of about 10 unit cells um, behaves in a very non-bulk-like way. And one thing I'm interested in studying, hopefully in the future, is trying to understand whether the same electrostatic effects which cause these polar distortions at these surfaces is a common phenomenon in these magnetic materials. And uh, also in materials like bismuth, uh, bismuth ferrite, which is a multi-ferroid material, which also has a piezo response which depends very strongly on the thickness. So there seems to be a general trend in a lot of these oxides, which is not very well understood, where you have thickness-dependent properties. And there are many explanations, there could be quantum effects, but what we would like to rule out and determine if it's actually a general principle operating in these materials is whether the surface charge actually affects the subsurface structure. And so one can think of potentially modifying the surfaces of different regions on the sample by simply changing the termination. For example, you can go at film with one termination and by simply changing the chemistry at the surface by one atomic layer, you can induce phase, one phase here with a different structure and a different property and a different phase in a different region. And I think this is going to have a lot of probably um, interest in people trying to look at domain walls, where in this particular case you can actually engineer specifically where you want domain walls to form. Um, I don't think it's going to be very easy to do, but I think it's something which is worth you know, looking at in the future. Um, one can also envision, um, since I showed you we can change complete materials from being metal to being insulators, one can also envision making circuits by simply depositing a pattern layer of one particular charge combination and make hopefully complex circuits based on you know, atomic layer manipulations. Um, there's some interest in looking at materials which have a property known as topological insulators. Um, so the materials I'm looking at, the bulk forms are metallic and the surfaces are insulators, but one can also envision looking at materials where the inverse is true, where the bulk is insulating, but you can induce distortions of the surfaces to make them metallic. And so yeah, just to summarize, I hope I've demonstrated that using a technique like MBE and these synchrotron-based techniques, um, we can demonstrate that we can actually c control the atomic scale structures of these um, films and also control their conducting properties. And uh, there's a very strong interplay between these very small, subtle distortions in these structures. And it's very important that we develop methods like these synchrotron-based techniques, which enable us to probe on a picometer scale you know, how these oxygens and how these materials are distorted away from bulk to give us a good understanding of why they're behaving the way they do behave. And this is, has important implications for designing complex oxide materials. So just to summarize, uh, to conclude, I'd like to thank my group at Yale, 
and the theory group, which we collaborate with, and my advisor at Michigan and Utah like Kobe at the Hebrew University, where I work on, on, with on, the, on developing the technique used for getting these 3D electron density structures. And um, the work has been done at the APS and the BNL and with funded sources being NSF, ONR, DARPA, and the Department of Energy. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll take any questions. Questions? David? Uh, your picture of the electric fields or electric force yes. at the surface as you change the upper layer yes. uh, made me wonder whether or not anyone has looked for, uh, for surface plasmons in this, or is the wavelength or difference in surface plasmons between the two cases. And uh, is it is the problem that the wavelength is too long so that it averages over the stack that you have, or has someone seen anything? I don't think anyone has seen this. So we've just seen this this past year. I don't think anyone has to study surface plasmons, but I think that's actually interesting. I'm sure people will start looking at it, hopefully. This will motivate that. I was a little confused by your discussion of topological insulators at the end, because there, I mean, the, the surface states are topologically protected. It's a, here, you're talking about distortion, which are clearly have nothing to do with topology and are not. It can be easily destroyed by some slight modification of the position. So I, I, I think we missed the connection there. I, I, I'll just throw that out there as a way of hopefully inducing a static distortion at the surface, which, yeah. As far as protection, I, I, it was just an idea for, for study. I'm not an expert on topological insulators, but I, from what I understand, I, it might be. I can't think of ways of protecting these things. Uh, so I, I was uh, interested in that you could elaborate a little bit more on that you know, type of theory or collaborative. Are they using density functional? Yeah, they're using density functional theory. What kind of functional are they using? Because um, I mean, a functional. I mean, I do density functional theory for small molecules. I guess here you're using like plane wave DFT, right? Yes. Um, but, and, and the functional matters a lot. It's particularly difficult to use, like, to get the correlation energy and exchange energy for those metal. Yeah. So as far as predicting the band structures, yeah. so they're using LDA plus U. Okay. Um, and um, so what you find is that the there's some additional details which depend sensitively on what you, you choose, but that energy split in doesn't seem to be affected by you, as far as I understand from your theory. Okay. Would you agree or disagree uh, with this idea uh, that, you know, if you leave the orbital degeneracy, that, that would perhaps start to enhance the antiferromagnetic correlation? Because usually these spin orbital models, we're talking about the insulating. Yes, right? Yes. Yes. Not, <laughs> there's nothing here, zero topic or whatever. So then, usually the spin orbital models tend to have, in addition to antiferromagnetic ground states, all kinds of scrambled stuff, because the orbital order might frustrate the antiferromagnetic correlations and so on, as Haluni has shown in there. So, so I would think that if you leave the orbital degeneracy, eliminate this degree of freedom, then perhaps one could strengthen the antiferromagnetic correlations. So, right. Um, so, yeah, I do think we do have air correlations, we've just not been able to measure them yet. So how do you measure them anyway? I mean, the, um, or how, like, how would you see that there are antiferromagnetic correlations in some film that you have? Um, ferromagnetic, I know you can measure. AF is a little harder. Uh, I think there are ways of Using linear diagrams to measure them, but I'm not too familiar with them. Mm. So you don't measure, right? Like no, I, I haven't measured. Yeah. So people probably do Newton scattering. But the nucleates have, I didn't talk, so they've, done, they've looked at, yeah, they've used Newton scattering to look at the, the bulk, um, the ones which are trying to go trans sharp transitions. And in their ground states, they do have anti magnetic order. But it's along like a quarter, quarter, quarter wave vector, right. which happens to be, which is actually unusual compared to many of these other systems. So it's not a simple. It's not a simple. Yeah. Yes. 